This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 45, recorded on November 20th, 2012. Hi, everyone. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. This Week in Microbiology is sponsored by ASM, the American Society for Microbiology, the world's largest membership society for microbiologists. Find out how ASM membership can help advance your science, your career, and your network. Go to asm.org slash advance. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Howdy. How are you doing? I, you, you told me that you survived the storm uh, in good part because of the prescience of your wife, who must have <laughs> known something was coming and bought a generator last year. That's, that's what you yeah. told me. Yeah, that's right. We, For her. Had 12 day, we were 12 days without power, and um, we did have a generator, which you bought last year. Over my objection, I said it wasn't necessary. <laughs> and um, I should know better, because she's always right, but sometimes it's just... Tripled your money. Boy. Also joining us today from Medical University of South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. Hey, Michael. I'm glad you survived the storm as as well. I, I was having tremendous flashbacks to my earlier era when I was a young assistant professor at the Medical University when we had Hurricane Hugo, and we went without power for a month. Wow. wow. So, and no one had generators then because no one anticipated it. It was quite a storm. Uh, we had many, many trees go down on our block, and they took that. They took out all the telephone poles, so all the wires were down, and it took a long time for them to get repaired. And in fact, we only got internet yesterday. Oh my! Which is uh, twenty days after after the initial thing. So, um, our our beach house. We have a house down in New Jersey. Got flooded, and we're still dealing with with working on that and trying to keep the mold down. We had to rip out all the insulation and on the lower two feet uh, around the rooms. And so it's been it, that the New Jersey barrier Island was creamed. I mean, we were very lucky that the, our house is intact, but many people lost everything just washed away. It's oh, awful. It's a uh, delicate place to build homes, you know, on a, on a thin strip of sand in the ocean. <laughs> It's kind of asking for it, and here it was. But uh, people will rebuild because people love to go to the beach, so they'll be back. Anyway, we did skip a week for that reason, everyone. Sorry about that. I just could not. Um, it was gasoline was hard to get in New Jersey, <laughs> and uh, it still is probably. It's okay now. Now it's fine. Uh, they've lifted the rationing and. And we're all okay, but uh, I couldn't travel, and uh, well, I had to stay home and make sure everything was okay. But we're back, and we're back with TWIM, with our usual wonderful stories about microbiology. And we have two today, as usual. Um, the first one is, um, we're going to have uh, Elio tell us about it. It's a science paper. Uh, called Wolbachia Enhanced Drosophila Stem Cell Proliferation and Target the Germline Stem Cell Niche. Are you, are you a fan of uh, Wolbachia, Elio? I am a huge fan of Wolbachia because <laughs> I am a fan of all uh, endosymbionts, of all organisms that grow inside of host cells. And this, of course, includes the second paper that we're going to discuss, which is Listeria. Mm -hmm. But to stick with the insects, um, endo or let me say something broadly about endosymbiosis because I'm, it's really one of the subjects that i gotten to love. Um, first of all, of course, we all have endosymbionts in us in the form of uh, mitochondria, and if we happen to be a plant, uh, plastids. Uh, and so endosymbiosis is true for all eukary eukaryotes, and it's true for some prokaryotes as well, but we won't go into that. Anyhow, uh, the 
in the invertebrates, however, there are endosymbionts galore. In fact, most insects, a lot of um, mollusks, sponges, uh, corals, anemones, symbionts. In many cases, they are photosynthetic, in which case they're called the zooxanthellae. Uh, in addition, uh, so in the invertebrates, this is a very widespread thing. And in fact, I've asked myself, why is that not the case in the vertebrates? And I haven't gotten a good answer. This is a, one of the Talmudic questions that we pose from time to time, in small things considered. And there isn't a good answer. I mean, maybe uh, some organisms are in the, on the way. It used to be co said that some rickettsia can survive in the body for years and years and years, a thing called brill fever, brill disease. Anyhow, never mind that. The fact is uh, endosymbionts are rare among vertebrates except for mitochondria and in higher plants except for plastids and mitochondria, but they're extraordinarily common in uh, invertebrates. So uh, there they are generally useful. Many are useful in the sense that they help uh, in photosynthesis, for instance. They in empower a non-photosynthetic host to become photosynthetic. They allow for nitrogen fixation, as in the root nodule and the symbionts. And in insects, a very large number have, make a lot of sense. In the uh, aphids, for instance, uh, aphids are insects which feed off plant sap. And plant sap is rich in sugars but poor in amino acids. So these guys would starve, these bacteria, but these uh, aphids would starve if it weren't for the fact that they possess endosymbionts called Buchnera and others, whole collection of others. And these guys supply amino acids to the host. So generally, it's. Um, a lot of mutualism, a lot of nutritional mutualism, metabolic mutualism, and so forth. In addition, what makes these guys interesting is that they have a reduced genome. Just like mitochondria have exported most of the genes to the nucleus, uh, these guys have a smaller number of genes, and their genomes, generally speaking, is under a million uh, base pairs, although some, and some are as small as 120, I think it is. 140,000 uh, base pairs. So that this genome reduction is a subject that is fascinating. Am I going on too long with my introduction? No, no I love it. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, so now we come. Oh, they're also AT rich. I mean, there's a huge amount of uh, speculation about the evolution of the endosymbiotic genome because they are living in a protected niche in the uh, selective pressure, such, a, such as it is, on them is very reduced. I mean, they live in a happy environment. So maybe that's why they don't need as many genes. Anyhow, lots of absolutely gorgeous work is being done on this, and uh, I, I recommend uh, readers or listeners to really go into the literature because it's just wonderful. Now we come to Wolbachia. Wolbachia is uh, perhaps the most common in the symbionts in the world. And you can say that it causes the greatest pandemic on Earth. That is, there's more Volbachia infecting insects than there's anything else, and a tremendous number of insects. The numbers are actually vary. The estimates of how many insects are infected with Volbachia goes from 20% to 80%. So somewhere in between that, there's a lot of insects infected with Volbachia. And Volbachia don't seem to play a role in what I've been talking about, in nutrition and metabolism and so forth. They seem to play a role in sex selection. Now, that's kind of weird. And what's weird about it is that they kill off the males. In other words, uh, if you have a mating between, uh, if you have Volbachia introduced into a male by mating, uh, they will not do so well. The females will take over. There is even feminization of some uh, males, which is, doesn't lead any place. Uh, but there is all, and so how do the females reproduce? Well, they reproduce by uh, parthenogenesis. The phenomenon whereby infected males mating with uninfected females, I didn't say that. When you mate infected males, with uninfected females, you get infertile descendants. And this is called cytoplasmic incompatibility. Okay, so what do they do? Besides, we'll go into this in a minute, but before that, it turns out that there are some side effects <clears throat> which are interesting and unexpected. For instance, Volbachia 
uh, infected mosquitoes seem to be resistant to dengue virus. So it's, it's uh, possible to think about making sure that the insects are all infected with Wolbachia, all these mosquitoes that carry dengue virus, not just some. It's not all. So possibly this is a role in defending the insect from certain viruses, which I think, Vincent, you'd like to hear. I mean, you sure this is... This yeah, we have talked about this quite a bit on TWIV. The, and in fact, the Wolbachia is... The, many of the, the mosquito that transmits dengue doesn't have Wolbachia. Right. In it, so people are trying to introduce Wolbachia into those mosquitoes, and then ha release them into the environment, and and hopefully they will not transmit dengue, but they will also take over native populations. So there's a there's an experiment being done in Australia uh, right. for that. And it's you it's haven't not, heard any any of the latest from that, have you? No, they published a paper uh, earlier this year or last year showing that these Wolbachia infected mosquitoes can propagate in the communities. Uh, of course, where they released it in, in Australia, there's not much dengue, so they couldn't see the effect on that. They have to go to a, an, a country with a lot of dengue, like uh, Vietnam, so that's what they're going to do next. Didn't that group present at the general meeting of the society in yeah. June? They did, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think what Alio has tapped into is, is, you know, Mother Nature is not rolling dice. It It's clear that this symbiote is really doing what it's supposed to do it's it's facilitating survival of um the higher organism and i hate to use that word higher uh but it's actually yeah, enabling no, this let's call it vertebrates vertebra well it's not a vertebrate it has no backbone <laughs> that's true no, no, sorry about that okay. we'll get letters <laughs> uh but i i think it it's really remarkable in in showing how selection pressure even across kingdoms works it it really is an elegant uh display of of active selective pressure because dengue um is a pretty virulent infection and dengue is constantly changing its spots yet the wolbachia is able to protect the insect from the ever-changing filovirus, the you know the the yellow viruses are notoriously changing their spots uh, in order to get into the host and and circumvent whatever defense mechanism the host has. Yet what the insect has had to do is go after this other thing to protect it. Very cool. Yeah, it is very cool. Now, uh, lest you think that this is all um, of concern to entomologists and to people who deal with, with things which are non-human, let me dispel that notion. It turns out that what, I'm what we're talking about has a tremendous relevance to people who live in places where there are uh, d devastating diseases caused by worms called filaria. Filaria cause diseases such as liver blindness, encephalitis, uh, and in dogs, heartworm. And these um, diseases, which can cause, as I say, they cause blindness, they cause the uh, debilitating swelling of limbs, all these are due to the fact that not only the Wolbachia infect insects, but they also infect nematodes, worms. So what happens is, that these worms get into the, for instance, the eye in Loa Loa, this is Africa. I believe it's in Africa and in Asia as well, I'm not sure. Um, and there, they cause an inflammatory reaction which leads to blindness. What's the inflammatory reaction do? Is it due to the nematode, to the worm? No, it's due to the Wolbachia they carry. The Wolbachia have LPS, lipopolysaccharides, like like good bacteria, good gram-negative bacteria should, and this sets off the inflammatory response. In fact, the wonder of wonders, if you treat patients with this disease with antibacterial antibiotics, like doxycycline, it seems to do some good. In other words, instead of giving people very nasty drugs intended to combat the worms, you can give them a simple antibiotic and combat the bacteria. And I'm not so sure I know 
how far this has been carried and how good it is. But it sounds like an interesting way in which what looks like an esoteric subject dealing with some non-human related topic is in fact directly related to the human population. But, uh, Michael, do you happen to know how effective antibiotics are in, in elephantiasis and, and liver blindness? No. Um, when I got the paper, I unfortunately was in a different country and I wasn't able to get to my library. Your library is your computer. What do you mean? Your library is your computer. Well, when, when you're in a different country, uh, it doesn't know where you are, so the library doesn't work because it wants your IP address, and so it, I couldn't get to it. But anyway, um, I think the issue is about delivery, and I, I don't think you can just generically supply um, an antibiotic, but I would wage a bet that if you could get the antibiotic into the insect system and you may need a, a pro drug to transport it in. You, you may need two drugs to transport it in and once upon a time when I was learning about antimicrobial therapy and they were first teaching me about plague they were telling me that you, you would use an old drug like spectinomycin to facilitate the entry of the penicillin into the um, eukaryotic cell. One, one drug would bring the other one in. So I'm wondering if the studies have been done to that level and extent where they use a drug to bring the truly bactericidal agent and, and doxy, while it'll eventually become uh, cidal, it, it really is a, a good static drug if you, if you think about the, the mode of action of most of the tetracyclines. They're they really are a, a classic static drug that can be easily diluted out. Yeah, so there, there, were, there have been clinical trials uh, in the UK, and they show that you can almost eliminate microfilaremia by uh, using doxy. So, but, you know, but we have other drugs that are used primarily, you know, albendazole. albendazole well, it's funny how the Volbachia story impinges on, uh, in, on humans in ways which are unexpected and terribly interesting, I must say. Yeah. So now let's talk about Drosophila. Well, I confess I had trouble with this paper because in order to go through this paper, you have to understand the um, uh, general system of Drosophila, and that turns out to be quite complicated. I didn't know it would be that hard. It's much more complicated than an ovary in a, a mammalian, in a, in a vertebrate. So <clears throat> I, I had to learn terms like germarium, uh, Follom, stuff like that. There's really a bunch of terms that I never knew. <clears throat> and what it is is that there's sort of an assembly line process whereby uh, stem germ, uh, germinal stem cells, cell, uh, cell, um, stem cells which are designed to become uh, germ cells, are made in a specialized place. They, they exist in a specialized place called the germ stem cell niche, and out of that comes a thing called the germarium, which is a collection of uh, follicles which, uh, and, and, uh, and germ cells to be, and out of this eventually comes the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the germinal cells. Now, the Volbachia is found in these sites, in the uh, germ cell uh, germinal stem cell niche, which is at the one end of the process. And they load it up. It's completely loaded. The cells are in the paper. You can see if you look at, if you, if readers go to this paper, they'll find in figure one that one end of this, uh, this ovary, like ovariole, I think it's called, uh, is just loaded wall to wall Volbachia. There's no room for anything else. Anyhow, <clears throat> so it turns out that in the Volbachia infected female, and now this is true, I should say, not all Drosophila are alike. We're not talking about Drosophila melanogaster, which is the standard uh, model system used in, by geneticists. We're talking about the different one called uh, Dolbachia mauritania, which seems to be quite different. And, uh, so I won't highlight the differences. I'll just stick with Mauritania. It turns out that here, Wolbachia-infected females make four times as much as many eggs. 
okay? About four times as many eggs. And this is interesting. So this is what, uh, what Bolbachia does in one insect. It does different things in other insects. But here it does that. And uh, they think that finding the mechanism is, um, is of interest, which I'm sure it is. And um, they uh, think that they can use the egg production as a readout of what's going on. It's a readout of uh, germinal stem cell activity. And how this happens and where it happens is the subject of this paper. So uh, having about fourfold more eggs in infected uh, Drosophilus than in uninfected is what this is about. So uh, they tested various possibilities. And one possibility is that there is an increased frequency of uh, germinal stem cell division in the Wolbachia plus versus the Wolbachia minus flies. And they do this with very elegantly. They have several markers. And by the way, the paper throughout is elegant in that they use a variety of different criteria, different tests to look for the same thing. This is, this is true throughout the paper. And I find that very encouraging because you can be fooled by just measuring one, one metric. Anyhow, they did this by uh, in various ways, and they found that the greater mitosis in the um, Wolbachia plus organisms in the um, germinal stem cells is not fourfold, but twofold. That is, this does not, uh, the increased mitotic activity of the cells does not account directly for a fourfold increase in egg production. So they did various things about it, and they um, and they they studied this in a as I say using morphology a lot, determining the level of activity of various things in various parts of this uh, ovariole or this uh, ovary-like structure. <clears throat> but what they asked is whether in fact the other twofold increase in egg production may not be due to a tampering with uh, program cell death, okay? And no, program cell death is a known regulator of egg production in Drosophila melanogaster, and therefore it's interesting. And also, uh, in wasps and in human neutrophils, you can show that Wolbachia or Wolbachia that have proteins inhibit host apoptosis. So guess what? They they, count, they quantitated the degree of apoptosis, and sure enough, it's decreased by, I guess it is a factor of two, or around a factor of two. Uh, so um, it may account for the second uh, half of the increased egg production. In other words, half of the increased egg production may be due to increased mitotic activity, and half is due to decreased in uh, apoptosis. And that is sort of it. I mean, they, there's a lot of elegance in the fact that you can find um, niches uh, in, uh, in, in adjacent flies. In some flies, the niches are, uh, have no Wolbachia. That is, Wolbachia infection is not universal. <clears throat> and so in the same population, you can compare and contrast the ones that are infected and the ones which aren't. So this is all, and it all says the same thing. So, and they also found what uh, what it is that Wolbachia targets, namely it targets a group of somatic cells that form the niche uh, supporting the germline, which is uh, called a hub in the male. Uh, so, in the male there's also some regulation. Uh, there's uh, upregulation in uh, apoptosis program cell death, which may account for the fact that males don't develop or male um, gametes don't develop. So that's about the gist of the paper. As I say, uh, to go into further detail, and it's, it's a very beautiful paper, but it takes uh, having a lot of patience to deal with the vagaries and intricacies, I should say, of the um, Drosophila genital system. So Wolbachia must encode uh, one or more inhibitors of apoptosis, then, right? That would be the, one, of the, one of the conclusions from this, yeah. That's right, that's right. And although... The fountain of youth. <laughs> that's right. 
Well, you know, there are, there are many viruses that encode such inhibitors, so maybe there's some homology. They could scan the genome by, by looking for homology with those. Oh, that'd be neat. So as I say, in neutrophils, they found that certain proteins from Wolbachia are sufficient to inhibit apoptosis. Mm. So they know a lot. I just didn't look it, look it up. I didn't look further, but the information is probably available for the asking. So does the right. does the four so does the fourfold increase in egg production in Wolbachia positive flies? Does that account for the reproductive advantage? I think it does. Yeah, mm. yeah, that's right. Uh, but that's another story, and it involves going back to melanogaster. Yeah, melanogaster. So I'm not sure I know just exactly how that intersects. Mm-hmm. But yes, it does. But it does. Okay, yeah. Michael, you were going to say something. No, uh, I think he put a bow on it at the end. Uh, I mean, it's it's really a very elegant story of uh, symbiosis and how, again, as I said earlier, how selection pressure really drives um, these interactions that we're seeing. It's beautiful. Yeah, these these. You remember the symbiosis story we did, where there was a bacteria within a bacteria within a pill pill bug, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mealybugs. Yeah, Mealybugs. Yeah, the mealybugs. Yeah, the pill bugs, all right. Yeah. Amazing That's stuff. Phenomenal. Yeah. That's ph- no, I think if you want to be in, uh, transported into a wonderland, just go and look into endosymbionts all over the place. It's yeah. just no end to their excitement. Yeah, they're all I, I, If I were younger and starting out, that's probably what I would choose to work on. Mm. That's if you could find funding. Yeah. That's if you could find funding. The question is, with with everybody moving towards translational-based research, whether or not they'll continue to fund such elegant basic science. It would be a, it would be a mistake not to. It'd be a Why? Mistake I not. We already yeah. talked about two, two applications. The, the, um, the, English the fountain of youth. Uh, the, and the uh, treating river, river blindness and uh, yeah. the so, you know, this is important. And who knows what else can be done? I mean, wherever insects intersect with humans, and they do plenty, uh, endosymbionts are almost certain to play a role. Yeah. And let's not forget agriculture. Yeah. I just made the generalization. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Elio, sure. for that. Uh, our next paper it was published in the EMBO Journal um, in uh, very recently. September 2012, October 2012. It's called Rig Eye Detects Infection with Live Listeria by Sensing Secreted Bacterial Nucleic Acids. Now, one of, one of the interests in my lab is the innate immune response to virus infection. So this, this paper caught my eye. Rig Eye uh, is um, one of the sensors for cytoplasmic foreign nucleic acids. So one of the earliest defenses against a microbial uh, infection is the innate immune system. And there are all sorts of sensors that uh, do detect whether something that's coming in is foreign or not. There are sensors at the cell surface. uh, There are sensors in the endosomes. And those are the the famous toll-like receptors. And then there are sensors. Which come from fruit flies. Let's not forget. They do. That's right. (laughs) Yeah, in fact, right. Nusslein and Vichaus were studying development in Drosophila, and they were knocking out genes and looking at the effect on fly development, and they found one gene knockout had a really weird effect. And they said, come over here and look at this fly. And 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 the the legend has it that Nusslein Volhard said, tall, which is, I guess, German for exclaiming, right, Elio? Yeah, it's something between uh, cool and gee whiz. Yeah. <laughs> So they became toll-like, and then it was found that they, in fact, not only do they have a role in development, but in mammals, they have a role in innate immunity, toll-like receptors. And then, of course, in flies, too, they do, because flies only have innate um, immunity. They don't have adaptive immunity. In the cytoplasm, there are sensors that detect nucleic acids. Rig eye is one of them. Another one is called MDA5. Um, there are what what are called nod like receptors, uh, NLRs that recognize bacterial peptidoglycans. Um, there's a, a DNA sensor called AIM two, 
And what all of these do is to detect when a foreign, uh, either nucleic acid or protein or peptidoglycan is present, and then they cause the cell to make uh, interferons and other cytokines that can lead to inflammation and and a, and a condition to uh, combat the microbe, whatever it may be. So this paper deals with sensing of listeria, and I think we talked about listeria the last time also in uh, TWIM44, and listeria, of course, is an intracellular uh, pathogen. It gets into cells. It's taken up by the endocytic pathway. It gets out of the phagolysosome and then replicates in the cytoplasm before spreading on to other cells. And this paper deals with uh, how these bacteria are detected. It's known that the bacteria have to be in the cytoplasm to be detected. Uh, and there was previous suggestion that bacterial nucleic acids were needed to be present in order be, to be uh, sensed. And so this paper uh, examines what sensors are involved in that. We, we know that uh, sensing is required for listeria to make a good adaptive immune response. Um, and a number of the sensors have been previously discovered. And one of them is very interesting. There is a molecule called cyclic di-AMP and cyclic di-GMP, which is secreted by listeria in the cytosol. And these are detected by the cell and detected by, and specifically by a protein called sting, which is a cytoplasmic protein uh, in the mammalian cell cytoplasm. And that detection leads to the um, production of... Um, Interferons. Well, define the, define the acronym, and you'll have what it does. There you go. Sting, St is, stimulator. Sting is stimulator of interferon genes. <laughs> there you go. Who said it was hard, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, so the, the, the immunologists have not met some. They're worse than the military in making abbreviations. Yeah, we, we've got, we have RIG-I, retinoic acid-induced <laughs> gene. Uh, yes. NVA5 is a melanoma-dependent. Uh, antigen. They're just all over. And some of these names have nothing to do with what we know them to function in innate immunity. Like tall. Yeah. So <laughs> in rig eye, you know, it was discovered because it was induced by retinoic acid, but that has nothing to do with innate immunity. No. Uh, but, um, you know, that's a, that's, uh, if you want to be an immunologist. That's the fun of this paper. That's, that's a, the fun of this paper because it, it drives home What's actually going on? Do you do you called it alphabet Story soup, apart. right? Didn't you, Michael? Once, uh, yeah, I get letters. <laughs> <laughs> you get letters. We always get letters. Okay, so the first thing they do is um, they take um, mutant listeria lacking listerolysin, um, and this is a gene that is required for listeria to get from the phagolysosome into the cytosol. All right, and if you infect cells with these mutants. Uh, they still will make, will induce the production of cytokines. So being in, in the phagolysosome is still consistent with making, uh, with being sensed by the innate immune system. All right. So then they say, well, you know, um, there must be some role for cytosolic uh, sensors in here. So the way they, they tease this out, you can get. And by the way, listeria replication is done in macrophages in all these experiments. They get them from mice, and they can look at mice with knockouts of very specific genes in the innate immune pathway. So they can look at specific adapter proteins that are involved either with toll-like receptors or with these cytosolic receptors. And what they find early on is that the toll-like receptors are not needed to get interferon induction uh, after listeria infection. They and do. an easy way to approach this paper, for those of you not familiar with um, reading this, this mixed literature, is to actually consider the macrophage uh, a mutant bacterial cell, if you will, in terms of getting these macrophages from knockout mice that are lacking these particular traits. And it's like asking the question in a mutant bacterial cell because what we're doing is – we're really trying to look at the overall expression pattern that is actually going on inside a cell. And listeria is just acting as a, if you will, set of genes, maybe? Yeah, you could look at it that way. So they take macrophages from mice lacking sting, um, rig eye, or MDA5. 
right? These are the three cytosolic receptors. Remember, sting is, is known to detect these cyclic di AMP and GMP. And rig I and MDA5 detect RNA. Uh, rig I detects single stranded RNA with a 5 prime phosphate, and MDA5 detects double stranded RNA. And what they find is if you, you infect macrophages with listeria in, from each of these gen- knockout mice, you find that all three proteins play a role in sensing the listeria and resulting in the production of interferon. The authors then made this this interesting leap. They said, okay, we know that sting detects secreted cyclic di-AMP and cyclic di-GMP uh, during listeria infection. Could it be that rig I and MDA are also detecting something that the bacteria are secreting? So what they did was to look at the uh, cell culture supernatant from listeria grown in culture, and they found DNA and RNA in the supernatant either of the cell or they made bacterial lysates and they, they find it there as well. All right? And they take these nucleic acids, they can either take RNA or DNA, they can purify them separately, and they introduce them into macrophages. And when they put secreted RNA into macrophages, they get a nice interferon response, which again doesn't depend on the, on the toll-like receptors. It seems to depend on the cytosolic receptors. And again, remember, they can figure that out by looking at macrophages from the knockout mice. And they find that Rig I and MDA5 are important for detecting uh, this secreted RNA. Sting... Uh, I- yeah. Let me interrupt something. I, something I don't understand. But they showed earlier with the listeriolysin minus mutants that the bugs don't even have to get into the cytoplasm. That's right. They can so, be within the phagolysosome and still... So they, where, they, where are these cytoplasmic receptors there? Ah, uh, well, this is jumping ahead a little, but presumably the nucleic acids are, are being secreted, right? And getting out of the lysosome into the cytoplasm. Okay. That's gotcha. And that's they're the eukaryotic transport systems. Yeah. Because that's what eukaryotes do is they move RNA, which is very unprokaryotic like of hysteria. Right. Um, an interesting uh, experiment that they did. So, so far, the secreted RNA, when introduced into macrophages, will stimulate interferon production. And that's dependent on Rig I and MDA5, but not Sting. Um, the secreted RNA is actually much better at inducing interferon than, than RNA you get from lysed cells. And um, they found that the secreted RNA binds Rig I very tightly. This is one of the ways that Rig I detects RNA by binding to it and then it's activated. It becomes an ATPase. Uh, and, and they show that is because the secreted RNA has 5' prime phosphates because if you remove them with a phosphatase, then that RNA doesn't uh, uh, bind Rig I very much. So, By the way, the size of the RNA in the DNA is really quite small. It's under 2 kb. That's right. So that's I don't know what that means, but maybe that's all that can be secreted from the bacterium. It could be, or maybe that the small uh, nucleic acids have some functional role, right? It means a lot. Oh boy. It means a lot for the people working in RNAi. Yeah. Th- this story is going to help the RNAi people think about targeting, t- thinking about size of their their inhibitory RNA, because we're sort of yeah. doing a little bit of the story here, but you have to ask the fundamental question, why does Listeria do this? And, you know, the, the, the short answer is it's trying to remodel the eukaryotic transcriptome. And what do our friends working in RNAi really want to do? They want to use small RNA to remodel the transcriptome of cancer cells and other things. So again, this drives home the importance of beginning to tease apart a seemingly insignificant translational type um, discipline. This is foundational basic science and understanding the biology of listeria and the macrophage. But Think about the potential that this knowledge can actually help the RNAi folks begin to really push their science forward. Maybe so. All right, so so far we know that secreted RNA 
is a ligand, mainly for rig I, le- much less so for MDA5. And that means or suggests that it's probably mostly single-stranded because MDA prefers double-stranded RNA. All right. Now, how about the secreted DNA? Again, if you put that into cells, remember, secreted DNA is purified from a listeria culture supernatant. If you put it into cells, you get interferon production. What they find, again, is using macrophages from their knockout mice, is that sting appears to be important for sensing the, the DNA, the secreted DNA that's introduced into cells. All right, so th- they find that unusual, and they wondered uh, whether, in fact, so they find sting is important, but also rig I seems to be important as well. And what they, s- they, they have an idea that maybe the DNA itself is not being sensed, but it's being transcribed into RNA. So they do the experiment with an inhibitor of RNA polymerase 3, of course, which is a polymer- DNA-dependent RNA polymerases that makes the smaller uh, RNA transcript, and they find that, in fact, if you inhibit Paul 3 you don't get very good interferon production after introducing DNA, secreted DNA, into cells. So isn't that cool that uh, you put DNA in cells, it's bacterial trans- DNA, bacterial DNA. Bacter- it's, it's transcribed by eukaryotic Paul 3 to make RNAs, which are then sensed by uh, Sting and Rig I. It's amazing. It's very cool. Why? Does it have to go to the nucleus to do that? Um, they didn't address that, but I would I would guess so because that's where Paul three is, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It probably does. When you trans when you introduce DNA into cells, it typically goes into the nucleus. So yeah, that's probably what's happening. Yeah. All right. Especially small molecular weight DNA. Yeah, that's right. Easier time. Okay, so next, how is the DNA and the RNA getting out of the listeria? And to, to really shorten a long story here, they suggest that maybe one of the ideas is that the bacteria are actively moving these nucleic acids outside with their secretory systems. And there are a whole, there are a whole bunch of them, of course. And they found that one secretory system called SecA2 is the one involved because they have a mutant defective uh, in this system. And when, uh, when they examine nucleic acids in the cell culture supernatants of mutants, of these mutants, they have much less DNA and RNA. Uh, and um, they also stimulate interferon to a, to a much lesser extent uh, than the wild-type listeria. So the SEC-A2 system appears to be involved in transporting... Uh, nucleic acids out of the cell, which then go on to stimulate uh, the interferon system. And again, this is happening in the cytoplasm of the mammalian cell. And this was not known previously that uh, SEC-A2 is involved in nucleic acid transport. Was it no. supposed to be a protein secretion mechanism, right? Right. Right. So, the, the, yes, that's actually, we can... That's, those are basically the results that I, I wanted to talk about, that the listeria get in the cytoplasm, they secrete DNA and RNA, small molecular weight DNA and RNA, through this SecA2 secretion system. And then in the cytoplasm, that is detected by uh, Sting, Rig I, and MDA5, either the RNA directly or the DNA by being transcribed uh, into RNA. Um, and this, so the SEC A2 system, as you said, Elio, this transports out proteins, but apparently it's also putting out RNAs as well. Um, I gotta say, and in all the years, I never heard of live growing bacteria secreting DNA and RNA, whatever the molecular weight. This is, to me, a shocking result. Well, can you ask ask the question a little differently, Elio? Is this nothing more than glorified conjugation, uh, where the DNA is moving out? Well, well, you can, yeah. Although RNA doesn't usually get transported, does it? No, that's true. No, RNA R, RNA is is the wild card in this. The funny part Big is time. that this is this is. Uh, Small molecular weight DNA and RNA. And there isn't small molecular weight DNA in the bacterium unless there's a very tiny plasmid there. So I, I, I'm totally surprised that 
This, they didn't identify the DNA. I mean, it'd be nice if they went in and sequenced it and tell us what it is. Is it this? Is it, is it some? Is this a new phenomenon? Hmm. I mean, you're right. Uh, conjugation is a way to transport uh, DNA from one cell to another, and therefore probably it can it can be spilled into the environment. But hmm. this is I, this is not that story. It may be analogous no. to it. And as far as I know, I never heard of it. That's an interesting point. If it's a specific DNA, or if it's a, so that's really important to figure it out. Same with the RNA, because the authors yeah. speculate that maybe uh, the proteins that are exported via the Sec A2 system, maybe they are nucleic acid binding proteins, and so they may be bringing out specific nucleic uh, nucleic acids. It would be interesting to figure out. It's, from a bacterial physiology point of view, this is brand new stuff. And it's highly energy intensive. This is a tremendous uh, energy burden to the cell to to transport both RNA and DNA out. There's a lot of energy involved in this, independent of the energy involved in the export. Right. Just making the materials is costing uh, this organism a tremendous amount. So it must support the fitness of Listeria while it's residing in the macrophage, and it must right, confer right. a sufficient selective advantage for it to be able to do its its wonders with well, polymerizing actin and all the other neat things that Listeria does inside a cell. Yeah, but uh, setting off an inflammatory response doesn't seem to be in the benefit of Listeria, but you never know. Well, it may be an accident, right? Uh, yeah, right. The, sure. So the, the authors speculate that these small RNAs may be, or, and DNAs, may be modifying the host transcriptome, the pattern of host transcription, for their benefit, all right? So there's a purpose to, to excrete or secreting these nucleic acids, but the host has evolved to detect them and say, ha, huh, there's a bacterium here we have to make interferon. Right. So that would make perfect sense. And so now we, uh, what has to be done is to figure out what these small nucleic acids are doing. And that's, that's some very interesting work that can be done there. I need to repeat what I said because it may be misunderstood. I'm not surprised at small RNAs because we know about small RNAs. I'm surprised about small DNAs. Yeah. That's the part that I never heard of. But also you're surprised that they're secreted, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at the level that they come out of the cell. I mean, this is not a trivial amount of DNA. Calculating and the amount of DNA that's secreted is huge. I mean, it's, it's, it's a substantial portion of the whole DNA in the culture. Yeah, yeah. So that that may make it sound like it's not spe sequence specific. It must be just random pieces because most of the DNA of the cell. So it can't just be a special DNA. That would be a, a very small proportion of the, it would be a very small amount total. Mm. I don't know, but if it had a, but look, if the if the purpose of the secretion is to influence host mRNA patterns, you would think that you would export specific control sequences, right? Oh, I, agree. I agree. It makes almost no sense otherwise. But yeah. yeah. Okay. The, other, the other question that is addressed by these results is why you need uh, live listeria in the cell in order to be sensed. Because people have shown before that if you kill the listeria, uh, the cell doesn't respond to them. And I think that the the fact that you need export of the nucleic acids by the Sec A2 system, uh, which requires live bacteria, that might explain uh, the require that requirement for sensing anyway. Does that make sense? Well, inflammation is evil. Remember, inflammation is evil to the to the eukaryotic system. They don't like to do inflammation unless it's absolutely necessary because the net result is you induce. Uh, apoptosis. You, right. You're going to end up getting rid of that cell. And so consequently, uh, you don't necessarily want to induce interferon gamma and interferon beta and all the other cytokine story unless it's beyond repair. And when you got a boatload of listeria in there, yeah. it's time to go. Right. So the the cool thing about this is that for a long time, people have been trying to figure out how Listeria gets sensed, and in the end, it turns out to be very simple. You look in the cell culture supernatant, and there it is, nucleic acid, and that's the story. It's not a high-tech solution, right? It's pretty straightforward. Well, yeah, yes and no. <laughs> As I say, I find the, the physiology, the bacterial physiology here, 
to be surprising, if not confusing. Yeah, it'll be. This will be very interesting. There will be a lot of work following this, and it should right. be. Just, you could say this is seminal results, right? Well, it's interesting that listeria turned out to be such a interesting bug. You know, we're sort yeah. of in the backwater of uh, food. Um, uh, acquired infection, biology, mm. but it's become very prominent both in research and in the real world. Right. All right. Uh, now I know you have to leave in a couple of minutes, Elio. But let's read this first email while you are here, because your name is mentioned in it. And this is an email from Elitsa, who writes, "Dear Twim Team, I just finished listening to Twim Thirty Five on LPS in Vibrio, among other topics. Doctor Elio Schechter mentioned a field in microbiology that I think is of great." interest to the scientific community and should definitely be covered in a podcast. The topic is outer membrane biogenesis in gram-negative bacteria. For decades, people have been hypothesizing and trying to find an evolutionary link that would answer the following questions. How did a second membrane in bacteria come about? And was the last universal common ancestor, LUCA, a single or double-membraned organism? These questions are extremely difficult to address and rely heavily on bioinformatics and phylogenetic analysis. I'm the first author of a paper that I'm suggesting here as a resource for a potential podcast. I've read extensive amounts of scientific literature before the paper was finalized and published in Cell to realize that currently there are no favorite hypotheses, and the very few hypotheses that exist are highly controversial. In our paper, we structurally characterize using cryo electron cryotomography the process of endospore formation. The process is typically thought of as exclusive to gram-positive bacteria, members of the phylum Firmicutes. However, we imaged a gram-negative organism, Acetonema longum, that is also able to sporulate. Through our structural studies, phylogenetic profiling, and biochemical analysis, we showed that A. longum possesses a true outer membrane, not only that, after sporulation, the spore is surrounded by two membranes, both of which originated from the inner membrane of the mother cell. Upon outgrowth, the second membrane of the spore becomes the outer membrane of the bacterium and therefore is remodeled from an inner into an outer membrane. These are fascinating new results that may provide us with a missing link between gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria and give insights into how an outer membrane uh, may have evolved and Elitza provides a couple of links to uh, the paper, and the, the title of this paper is Peptidoglycan Remodeling and Conversion of an Inner Membrane into an Outer Membrane During Sporulation, from Caltech. Wow, wow. What, what can I say? <laughs> Eliza, you're the expert. <laughs> I can't add anything to this. You, your paper is phenomenal. I think it's a fine example of the use of cryotomography. I started essentially in the Jensen lab at Caltech, where, where you're working. It's, it's a phenomenal paper, and I uh, stand in awe of what all can be yet achieved in, uh, in, the, in this field. I, I wouldn't dare add something about whether the first bacterial cells or recognizable bacterial cells or whether the, first, or whether the last universal cell ancestor was, uh, was, uh, had two layer two cell, uh, cell membranes or one. I think you're right. This is highly debated and everybody has the favorite theory. And right now that is probably a game I don't care to play. But uh, <laughs> what, you say, what you say is absolutely right. I'm, I'm, I'm stunned by this paper and I think we, we, we should pay greater attention to it. So thank you, thank you. I think we should probably do a, an episode on this. Oh, yeah. You know, it, it's a new target. If you think about what we're desperately in need of is new antibiotics, it, it could be a potential new target to try to understand the biogenesis of that outer membrane to really make gram-negatives more vulnerable. Right, sure. right. Uh, yeah, I think it's a, yeah. Uh, I once asked the question, are there more gram-positives or gram-negatives by weight on Earth? Because... <laughs> By uh, phyla, the gram-negatives outnumber the gram-positives. But that has nothing to do with how many there are on Earth. It's not a clear answer because in a lot of early 
metagenomics, you would miss a lot of gram positives because they tend to sporulate. Here's a gram negative sporulator. But if you have spores, it may be easy to miss in making the DNA for metagenomic analysis. So I, I still don't know the answers to whether gram positives outnumber gram negatives or vice versa. Anyhow, great, great input. Loved it. Okay. Shall we do one more before you go, or do you want to? Yeah, go ahead. All right. The next one is from Fabio, who writes, Dear Professor Schmidt, I listened to the podcast in microbiology that you recently contributed with Vincent, Joseph, and Elio. You made a very nice summary and commentary of the International Symposium on Staphylococci held last August in Lyon. Furthermore, I would like to thank you all for all your nice words about the symposium that we organized and on our recent opinion paper titled, Inferring Reasons for the Failure of S. aureus Vaccines in Clinical Trials and published in Frontiers Cell and Infectious Infection Microbiology. Fabio is, a, is at Novartis in Italy, in Siena. I guess he organized or co-organized the meeting, Michael? He co-organized the symposium on, on vaccines, on okay. staphylococcal vaccines. And his group at Novartis is the vaccine group that's uh, developing all of Novartis's uh, vaccine efforts. Ah, very good. so this is uh, I, I, this is a nice letter to get. I'm glad he listened. Yes, Fabio Bagnoli, uh, Italy. What's Bagnoli? Little bath. Bagno, bagno, yeah, bagno is a bath. I don't know. Bagnoli is a little. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay, how are we doing on time, Elio? Uh, one more. All right, that's one from Alice. Hey, Twimmers, this is from a wildlife rehab newsletter. Thought you might be interested. MRSA in wildlife. It's an article. Uh, one of the most notorious and hard-to-treat bacteria has been found in wildlife. Uh, researchers isolated methicillin-resistant Staph aureus in two rabbits and a shorebird. Wild animals may act as an environmental reservoir for the disease from which humans can get infected. Molecular typing of the isolates showed that the shorebird carried a hospital-associated strain of MRSA, while the rabbits had community-associated strains. The rabbit's MRSA was also resistant to tetracycline, which is common in farm animals. Perhaps most troubling of all was that one of the pigeons carried a staph bacterium that, while still sensitive to methicillin, was resistant to, the, to vancomycin, used as a last resort in MRSA infections. What do we think about that, Michael? I, I think um, Staph aureus is probably uh, human Staphylococci, and the contribution of, of Staph aureus to these other wild animals, they probably have their dominant Staphylococcal mm. species. And the fact that um, the antibiotic markers are moving in these microbes is is not all that surprising uh, you know in Hawaii uh, the surfers are, are are getting have MRSA uh, from their scrapes and their abrasions from the surfing and they have now given it to the bottlenose dolphins uh, yeah. in off of Oahu and um, my former technician is doing a project for NOAA in which she's looking at the MRSA incidents in uh, dolphins so it's just not associated with birds and farm animals. It's even in something as wild as, as a dolphin. And if you think about it, that's a much more dilute environment when you're in seawater than it is yeah. you know, with a pigeon interacting with um, man, as it were. Yeah. So this is not all that surprising, and it really drives home the need to, to really begin to marshal our work in developing new antimicrobials. So basically, these this rabbit and shorebird um, staph aureus they came from people, right? Yeah. And we have enough SA in us, and that's that's more of a problem than getting it from a rabbit or a bird, right? Yeah, yeah. We have our own dominant species. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, listen to this is a short one, Alia. Listen to this one. This is from Peter. He writes, Happy Halloween greetings, Twim team. For a slightly microbiology-themed Halloween costume, I constructed a plague doctor mask. You can see its construction on this site. And he provides a picture of this mask, Elio, and instructions on how to make it. You, you have to check this out when we publish this episode, Elio. You know what a plague doctor mask is, right? <laughs> the, one with the, the one with the beak, yeah. right? 
Yeah, they used, right. they used to wear these so they supposedly wouldn't get plague. It's got a beak. It's white. They, they, used, to put, they used to put the perfume, the tissue in there. That's right. That's right. That was supposedly warded off the bacteria. So he made it, and he has instructions. It worked as a filter. It looks beautiful. What a great job. I think I have to use this as our episode picture, even though we didn't talk about plague. Anyway, thanks, Peter. That's really great. Okay, Elio, you're, you are free to go. Thank you very much. See you next time. Bye. Have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. Uh, my, um, w- the uh, infection microbiology course that is taught to medical students here has, as you may imagine, a very thick syllabus. And on the cover every year is always this picture of uh, the plague doctor with his mask on. Ah. And you actually know, um, the, the fellow here who included that picture in the syllabus is Frank Lowy. Uh-huh, I do know Frank. So I forwarded it to him, and he loved it. He said he's going to make it for next year's Halloween. <laughs> As only Frank kid. Isn't that a beautiful job, though? It's just and it, yeah. it's a nice picture with a red background. Yeah, it, they've done a nice job. I, I was... Uh, a variation of an Apple genius for uh, uh, Halloween. I was, uh, but I used the Twim logo. Nice. And so I was Dr. Twim. Very the, good. The, enti- the entire dental school dressed up as Apple geniuses. Yeah, yeah. And, and they were uh, such remarkable things as eye brush and eye floss. <laughs> and- That's very good. Uh, here we didn't have Halloween because it was too much of a mess. The kids couldn't walk around. Unfortunately. Uh, the next one is from Michael, which is not our Michael, but another Michael. Hello, Twim. And he sent a link to an article in The Guardian. World's biggest geoengineering experiment violates UN rules. I feel like this issue is quite broad and interesting and was hoping that ocean geoengineering might be worth discussion. It's my understanding that scientists are wary of such approaches, to say the least, but this event seems to demonstrate a certain necessity for the international community to come to terms with geoengineering and sort out strategies and methods. As a layman, I'd be very interested in what you guys have to say. So basically what happened here, a controversial American businessman dumped around 100 tons of iron sulfate into the Pacific Ocean as part of a geoengineering scheme off the west coast of Canada in July. The iron has spawned an artificial plankton bloom as large as 10,000 square kilometers. The intention is for the plankton to absorb carbon dioxide and then sink to the ocean bed, a geoengineering technique known as ocean fertilization that he hopes will net lucrative carbon credits. Are you you aware of this, Michael? I've I've heard of... um there's there's a whole program in the Department of Energy specifically looking at uh, carbon sink and carbon sequestration, mm-hmm. and you know it's it's not a bad concept, but unfortunately um, humans have been doing um, ocean geoengineering just by dumping our sewage out into the water, and we've of course been taking out coral reefs. Yeah. With um, yeah. Yeah. some such simple bacteria as serratia, so um, this one generating uh, ten thousand square meters of uh, artificial plankton bloom, I, I think um, the hundred tons of iron sulfate have a bigger issue in terms of the dissolved CO two in the water and and the temperature and the pH, and it's an extremely complex problem that um, you almost need to read the entire backstory behind this experiment because I don't think, um, you know, you could just take 100 tons of iron sulfate and dump it. <laughs> <laughs> it seems I mean, simplistic to me. Yeah, it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's really pretty complicated. And, you know, everybody is, of course, concerned about, um, you know, carbon sequestration and, and how best to get algae to effectively harvest carbon and actually then somehow sequester it. But remember, the dead bodies, the calcium carbonate has to sink because that's what is actually tying up the CO2. It's the skeleton. Yeah. Going back to Elio's favorite organism that, that we've talked about a couple times. The e Yeah, the e 
Are there people who would be good to have on TWIM and who could talk about this? Is this worth? Is this TWIMable? I think it is. I, I think the whole carbon sequestration story is is something that we may wish to begin to explore to talk about the science that needs to be done and how do you design a an appropriately controlled experiment. Um, and whether or not this 100-ton experiment was, yeah, yeah. you know, really sanctioned or not. All right. Well, let's, let's identify some, uh, some people we could get on to talk about this. So yeah. he, he, the, the article concludes scientists are debating whether iron fertilization can lock carbon into the deep ocean over the long term and have raised concerns that it can irreparably harm ocean ecosystems, produce toxic tides and lifeless waters, and worsen ocean acidification and global warming. Thanks for the great podcasts. All right. Thank you, Michael, for sending that. And the last one is from Oystein, who writes, Dear Twimians, I just found the latest edition of Clinical Microbiology and Infection and read about a concept that is new to me, culturomics. Maybe you'll be as intrigued as me by this concept. It contrasts well with all the high-throughput genomics hype these days. It might be a good article to put on the show someday. Here are the links. Microbial culturomics, paradigm shift in the human gut microbiome study. Uh, are you aware of this, Michael? Th this was news to me when I first saw it. I thought this was just another play on words, but um, this is something I think our esteemed colleague, Elio, would like to weigh in on because, you know, the whole issue of um, viable and non-culturable, you know, you can culture anything if you ask you develop the right medium in order to get the microbe to grow, grow and then establish the mm -hmm. right. Image. So I think this is an emerging field in our discipline. And when we have, uh, have our discussion with Ellen Joe, uh, this may be something to talk with her about and get the clinical microbiologist perspective on this. Uh, also, Joe Handelsman would be interested in this as oh, well, right? Absolutely. The two of them together. <laughs> Yeah, after all, remember, Joe Handelsman is the one who, who coined the – actually probably got us all started on the omics bandwagon with her coining of the term uh, metagenomics. Hmm. So in this technique, they take uh, stools from people and then use 212 different culture conditions. That's what microbial culture omics is. And get what you grow up by uh, mass spec and ribosomal RNA sequencing. And then they do the same three samples by, you know, pyro sequencing, and they compare them, and they get an idea of how many they could culture in the end. Interesting. Yeah, let's it's it's a brave new world. <laughs> uh, we will uh, put this on the list and see if Joe would be uh, interested in discussing that with us. Uh, and he concludes. Thank you for three great shows to walk, commute, run, bike, and do housework too. All the best. Oystein is from Norway. Works in a hospital in clinical microbiology. Oh, so Oystein, you might be interested in our upcoming clinical microbiology show. We had hoped to do it a couple of weeks ago, but Sandy intervened. Hurricane Sandy, <laughs> and we had to cancel. We had Joe, Ellen, all lined up. She was in... Um, Panama. Is it Panama? Yeah. You know, every week she's in a different country. It's amazing. Because she sent me her schedule. She's all over the world. Well, I was in South America last week. And today I'm speaking with you from Liverpool, England. Oh, I thought you were in South Carolina. Wow. You no. could have fooled me. Yeah. we <laughs> had a good. I didn't want to jinx it by telling you. Yeah, we, You have a wireless connection there? No, yeah. It's a wireless connection. But I paid for the extra speed. That's so, great. It sounds very it, good. Yeah, the Europeans know how to do Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, let's wrap up TWIM45. You'll be able to find this episode and all the others, all 45 episodes at microbeworld.org slash TWIM. You can also subscribe at iTunes and the Zoom Marketplace. And if you like TWIM, one of the best things you can do to help us is to go over to iTunes and leave a comment or just rate the show. It helps to keep us visible there so more people can discover us. If you have questions or comments, we'd love to get them. Send them to twim at twiv.tv. 
It's twim at twiv.tv. Now, don't use twiv at twiv.tv because that would be for my other show. And sometimes you do that, and I get it's it's a little confusing for me to figure out what show they're for. Sometimes I can figure it out, sometimes not. So twim at twiv.tv. Elio Schechter, of course, is at Small Things Considered, and we thank him for joining us. Michael Schmidt is usually at the Medical University of South Carolina, but today he is in where, Liverpool. Liverpool, where the Beatles got their start, right? Correct. Or something like that. I think they were in Hamburg, Germany first, but Liverpool seems to be... Weren't they from Liverpool originally? They were from the Manchester, Liverpool area, yes. And Liverpool is a, a coastal town, is that right? It's absolutely a coastal town. I'm I'm getting the North Sea breeze. <laughs> Must be chilly there, right? It's chilly, and it's the Chamber of Commerce for uh, Britain. Dark, gray, and drizzly. Uh, what are you doing over there? I am attending uh, the His Fizz Conference, the Federation of Infection Society and Health Care Infection Society of the UK and Greater Europe. I came over here for um, to present uh, some of our copper stuff. You going to get back for Thanksgiving? Yep, I leave tomorrow. So it's nighttime there. You should. You're done, right? No meeting tonight. No, we we have the gala, and uh, so I'm off to I'm off to the gala. All right, I wouldn't want to hold you from that. Thank you, Michael, all for right. joining us. Thank you, thank you, Vincent. Have a good Thanksgiving yourself. Surviving you too. the hurricane. You too. Bye bye. Bye. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology ws. I'd like to thank ASM, the American Society for Microbiology, for their support of Twim. And Chris Kandine and Ray Ortega for all their technical help. And don't forget asm.org slash advance to find out how being a member of ASM can help advance your science, your career, and your network. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Microbiology.